Um, I want to begin this evening by paying tribute to the Academy of Government. It's doing a fantastic amount of really good work to promote debate and discussion in the run-up to next year's referendum through academic research, expert seminars and public lectures like this one. I very much welcome all of the work that you're doing and I thank you for it. Uh, because as Scotland faces its most important, in my view, most exciting decision and indeed its biggest opportunity in 300 years, it's really good to see this university continuing its long and very proud tradition of engaging with the great issues of the day. As Charlie has just said, the title of my lecture this evening is A Renewed Partnership of the Isles. And in this speech, I'm going to make three key arguments. Uh, firstly, that independence is not a departure from, but the logical continuation of the devolution journey that Scotland embarked upon in 1997, and that if Scotland votes yes in September next year, independence will be accepted as the normal state of affairs for our country just as quickly as the devolved parliament became an established part of our civic and political life as a nation. Secondly, I will argue that as part of the Westminster system, Scotland suffers a deep democratic deficit with a very real impact on jobs, on well-being and life chances in Scotland that only independence can close. And third, uh, that far from marking a separation from our friends and relations across these islands, independence actually opens the door to a renewed partnership between us. And at the outset of my remarks this evening, I ask you to bear one very important fact in mind because I believe it's relevant to all three of the arguments that I will make this evening. Uh, this referendum will be hard fought. Indeed, we're already seeing plenty of evidence of that. Those of us on the yes side and those on the no side will argue our cases with passion, with determination, and we'll do so from positions of sincere and firmly held conviction about what is best for Scotland. But on the 19th of September next year, on the day after the referendum, if Scotland has voted yes, we will no longer be on opposing sides. We will all of us be on the same side. We will be on Scotland's side. Senior politicians currently arguing against independence will become part of the team that will negotiate our independence. The UK government, I believe, will honour the Edinburgh Agreement and they will work with us to ensure a fair and an orderly transition to independence, not least because it will be in their own best interests to do so. All political parties will then compete to form the first government of an independent Scotland in 2016. And all of society, each and every one of us, will have a part to play in the development of our new constitution, in the building of our new country. Now, none of that should be surprising or contentious in any way, but I do think it's worth emphasising because however strongly the arguments are made over the next 16 months, all sides in the debate do have Scotland's best interests at heart and all of us, without exception, will work in Scotland's best interests after the referendum to make sure as a country that we succeed and prosper. And that's not just common sense, it's also what the devolution experience points us to, which takes me to the first of the three arguments that I will make this evening. The Scottish Parliament is only 14 years old, and yet it is such an established part of our political life that it's actually quite hard to remember what Scotland was like without it, what Scotland was like in the days before we had our own Parliament here in Edinburgh. And because it has become so accepted so quickly, even by those who bitterly opposed the creation of the Scottish Parliament, it's very easy to forget that its establishment was so contentious. Now, of course, the alliances were very different to those that have formed on the yes and the no sides of the independence referendum. But the referendum campaign in 1997 was nevertheless very strongly contested. And what's also interesting looking back is how many of the arguments against devolution were exactly the same as the arguments 
being made against independence today. For example, that the process of setting up a Scottish Parliament would be too difficult and too costly, or that a Scottish Parliament would somehow use its powers in ways that would be harmful to Scotland, to our society and to our economy. Uh, this quote from a young journalist going by the name of Michael Gove uh, is a case in point. Uh, in a piece in the Times in August 1997, just uh, weeks before the referendum, he said that business leaders believed that devolution would, and I quote, encourage a brain drain, a flight of finance as well as skilled labour, add to the burden of business taxation at a local level, create a climate of continuing political uncertainty and damage the standing of Scottish financial products in English eyes. Uh, and then William Haig, he said in a speech in Glasgow just the very week before the referendum that devolution would make no difference to schools, to hospitals, to jobs or to business. The tartan tax will lead to foreign investors saying no to Scotland. Uh, who would have thought that some 16 years later uh, they would both be in a UK cabinet making exactly the same arguments against Scotland becoming an independent country? The serious point, of course, is this. They were wrong. They were 100% wrong. Because far from making no difference to our hospitals, devolution has enabled us to safeguard the NHS and reintroduce free prescriptions. Rather than adding to the burden of businesses, the Scottish Government has been able to use its powers to create the most competitive business taxation system anywhere in the UK. Devolution hasn't encouraged a brain drain. On the contrary, full-time Scottish students at our colleges and universities have reached an all-time high thanks to our policy of free tuition. In England, applications for universities have fallen dramatically. And far from seeing a flight of investment, we had it reconfirmed just yesterday in the Ernst & Young Annual Business Attractiveness Survey that Scotland is the most successful part of the UK outside of London at attracting foreign investment. So the experience and the reality of devolution has been very, very different to what its opponents predicted. And I believe the same will be true of independence. Because devolution wasn't the status quo, it was easy for its opponents to characterise it as a leap in the dark, to spread and create uncertainty, to make people afraid of the risks that they said would materialise, uh, just as I would argue those on the no side of this debate are seeking to do today about independence. But what devolution has actually done is demonstrate the fundamental truth that is at the very heart of the case for independence, and that is that the best people to take decisions about Scotland's future are the people who live and work in Scotland. And that's the argument that I believe will carry the day in September next year. It's the reason why, after the referendum, if Scotland votes yes, independence will feel as normal and natural as devolution does to all of us now. And it's what I mean when I say that independence is the continuation of the devolution journey. Once Scotland becomes independent, it's hard, I think, to imagine there being very much nostalgia for the current constitutional settlement. You know, what we have in Scotland at present is often characterised by those on the other side of the debate as being the optimal arrangement. I, I take the opposite view. I believe that it is the very success of devolution, the gains we have enjoyed uh, from having independent decision-making powers over health, education and criminal justice that has thrown the spotlight very firmly on the deep democratic deficit of leaving powers over the economy, welfare and defence in the hands of Westminster. Devolution has demonstrated that independence is the only way of ensuring that Scotland's government is fully accountable at all times to the people who live in Scotland. And that brings me to my second argument, the simple and powerful democratic case for independence. Uh, there are, in my view, and I don't think it will surprise anybody to hear me say this, there are many flaws with the current Westminster system of government. The first past the post electoral system is deeply unrepresentative. The power of the House of Lords contradicts basic principles of democracy and Westminster's doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty is incompatible with the fundamental principle that in Scotland sovereignty rests not with Parliament but with the people. 
But while I take issue with all of these flaws in the system, all of them could, in theory, be reformed, even although I have to confess there is little sign of that happening uh, at the present time. But the biggest problem with Scotland's current constitutional position that majority Scottish opinion on issues that affect our everyday life can always be outvoted, cannot be dealt with through change at Westminster. Since Scotland only elects 59 out of 650 MPs, Scotland's votes rarely, almost never in fact, influence the overall outcome of a UK general election. There have only been 26 months in the last 68 years 26 months in the last 68 years, uh, from 1964 to 1966, and between the two elections in 1974, when MPs from Scotland have made a difference to the chief governing party at Westminster. Every other government we have had down these years would have been elected south of the border anyway, regardless uh, of who was elected in Scotland. By contrast to that, for 34 years of the last 68 years, Scotland has been governed by parties that were elected to fewer than half of Scottish constituencies. Now, my argument is that that is not just an abstract point of constitutional theory. It translates into decisions that affect the jobs, the well-being and the life chances of everyone here in Scotland. Let me just give two examples from the last decade. In 2003, a majority of Scottish MPs voted against the invasion of Iraq. And in 2013, earlier this year, 90%, nine out of 10 of Scottish MPs cast their votes against the bedroom tax policy. And there are many, many more examples besides of policies being implemented in spite of a majority of Scottish MPs democratically elected here in Scotland voting against their implementation. And the bedroom tax is obviously topical, but it's also a very good case in point, not just because it's unjust, although I would argue it is, but because it is legislation that would never have been passed by a parliament in Scotland with Scotland's problems and priorities at its heart. The bedroom tax is a policy driven primarily by rising rental and housing benefit costs in London and the southeast of England, not here in Scotland. And yet, here in Scotland, 100,000 people will be penalised unless they move to single room accommodation, despite the fact that only, we only currently have a supply of 20,000 single roomed socially rented houses. And that's just one example. The bedroom tax is part of a wider programme of welfare reductions for Scottish households, which will total £2 billion a year by 2014-15. Most of that money taken out of the pockets, not of the unemployed, not of the pockets of those out of work, but of those in work and earning low wages. And the gap between rich and poor will grow as a result. You know, the UK is already, right now, today the fourth most unequal country in the developed world. Since 1975, income inequality amongst working age people has increased faster in the UK than in any other country in the OECD. One in five Scottish children now lives in poverty. 800,000 Scots live in fuel poverty. For far too many people across our country, inequality is affecting their health and blighting their life chances and it's holding back our economy as well. And yet, instead of being able to focus all of our energies and all of our considerable resources on tackling this inequality, we are powerless in the face of policies being implemented by a government that actually lost the election in Scotland. Policies that, according to estimates by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, will result in 50,000 more Scottish children living in poverty by the year 2020. And there's a similar story of unrealised potential when you look at Scotland's economic growth record. Scotland has contributed more per head of population in taxation revenues than the rest of the UK in every single one of the last 30 years, every single one of the last 30 years. And over the last five years, our fiscal position has been stronger than the UK by a total of more than 12 billion pounds. We undoubtedly, beyond any argument, have the resources to become a successful independent country. And yet between 
1997 and 2007, Scotland's average annual growth rate was 2.3% uh, compared to 2.8% for EU nations of a comparable size. Uh, the Fiscal Commission Working Group said this, there is no obvious underlying characteristic of the Scottish economy that can explain this underperformance. But one constant factor throughout these years has been Scotland's place in, in a United Kingdom which has become increasingly centralised, with London and the South East benefiting often to the detriment of almost everywhere else, not just Scotland, but other regions uh, across the UK as well. Uh, the gap between the richest and poorest parts of the UK is wider than in any other country in the European Union. Uh, David Cameron himself, when he was first elected Prime Minister in 2010, said that an economy with such a narrow foundation for growth is fundamentally unstable and wasteful. And that centralisation, in my view, has been compounded by straightforward mismanagement, the failure to address difficulties in the banking sector early enough, the massive cuts to capital spending in the face of an economic downturn, the refusal of successive governments to invest oil wealth in a fund that would benefit future generations. And the question is, would this have happened in this way in an independent Scotland? Would inequality have grown in energy-rich Scotland while our economy underperformed? Uh, now, let me be absolutely clear at this point. My argument is not uh, that no past Scottish government has made mistakes or that no future independent Scottish government would ever make mistakes or get things wrong. Of course it would. My argument is that the evidence suggests we would have taken and would take in future a different direction as a country if we were independent. We know that Scottish MPs at Westminster under both Labour and Tory governments have voted against many key aspects of UK policy. We also know that successive Scottish parliaments, uh, and this is parliament as a whole I'm talking about, not any single party, have legislated for progressive purposes. Uh, the first Scottish parliament introduced world-leading homelessness legislation. The second parliament was bold enough to take really bold and courageous action to tackle Scotland's health inequalities, uh, chiefly through the ban on smoking in public places. The third parliament reintroduced free university education. This parliament that we are in just now will see world-leading action to tackle Scotland's relationship with alcohol and legislation to expand and transform early years education and care. At the same time, we've adopted policies to support economic growth, cutting business rates, promoting Scotland abroad, giving coordinated support to infrastructure and to key sectors of our economy. And these achievements don't belong to any one political party in Scotland. Many of them indeed commanded support right across the parliament. And that's not surprising. It simply reflects the fact that members of the Scottish Parliament of all parties have worked together to reflect the values and promote the aspirations of the people who voted for us. A recent Scottish Social Attitudes survey asked people in Scotland uh, if they trusted the Scottish Government to act in Scotland's best interests. 71% of people said that they did. For the UK Government, that figure was 18%. It's not surprising, therefore, in my view, that there's a clear majority of people in Scotland who want the Scottish Parliament to have control over welfare and taxation. They recognise that without these powers, we can mitigate UK policy, but we cannot change it. And by 2014, I believe that that view will have turned into support for independence. Independence means that we wouldn't have to become a more unequal society. We wouldn't have to see our natural resources squandered because the choice to do things differently and better would lie here with us. We wouldn't have to lobby UK governments, usually unsuccessfully. We could seize opportunities and tackle challenges for ourselves. And because of that, independence would enable us to create a healthier relationship with the other nations of these islands. And this leads me to the last of my three arguments uh, and themes this evening. Because after all, with independence, uh, Scotland could no longer, as we sometimes do, blame London for things that go wrong. Responsibility for our successes, as well as our mistakes, would unambiguously lie 
here with us. And the rest of the UK could no longer express concern that Scotland was in some way being subsidised, although I think one of the benefits of this referendum campaign is that this myth is heard less and less frequently anyway. Scotland and the rest of the UK would both stand on our own two feet, taking our own decisions and working together on issues of common interest. A relationship would be what it should always have been, a partnership of equals. Full powers in Scotland and an equal relationship with our friends and neighbours, that really would be the best of both worlds. And you know, we don't have to look very far away to see examples, real life examples happening right now of successful cooperation between neighbours. The Nordic Council has representatives from Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland and Norway, as well as from Greenland, the Faroes and Aland. Last year, the Nordic Council celebrated its 60th anniversary. The report that was commissioned to mark that anniversary noted that one reason the Council works is that the peoples of the five Nordic nations share culture, values and a sense of affinity. For these islands, even under devolution, we can see the outline of how a renewed partnership of the Isles might work. The British Irish Council was set up in 1998. Its secretariat is based here in the city of Edinburgh. The Council right now has representatives from two independent states, three devolved administrations and three Crown dependencies. It's very easy to see how it could be adapted to include three independent nations rather than just two. And in, in addition to formal mechanisms for discussion, there would be day-to-day -day cooperation, just as there is now in areas where we already have independent powers in Scotland. For example, there was cooperation between law officers in Scotland and England to secure a single prosecution in the aftermath of the Glasgow airport terrorist attack. At the height of the riots in parts of England in 2011, Scottish police forces sent officers to help their colleagues in England. During the water crisis in Northern Ireland in the same year, Scotland sent hundreds of thousands of litres of water to Northern Ireland. And when I was health secretary during the swine flu crisis, I worked closely and constructively on a daily basis with my colleagues in other UK administrations to make sure we had a joined up and coordinated response. That level of mutual support would continue because that's what good neighbours do. David Cameron uh, visited Ireland last year and when he was there, he and uh, the Taoiseach issued a joint declaration. And I'm going to read to you what that joint declaration said and I want you to listen to it very carefully. He said, it said, the relationship between our two countries has never been stronger or more settled, as complex or as important as it is today. Our citizens, uniquely linked by geography and history, are connected today as never before through business, politics, culture and sport, travel and technology, and of course, family ties. Uh, our two economies benefit from a flow of people, goods, investment, capital, and ideas on a scale that is rare, even in this era of global economic integration. That statement could easily apply to an independent Scotland and its relationship with the other nations of these islands because they would be our closest friends as well as our closest neighbours. The fact is that independence has never been and never will be about walking away. Independence is about taking responsibility and working together. Working together with other nations in the United Nations, in NATO, in the European Union, in the British Irish Council and in many other organisations. But crucially, it's about working together as an equal partner rather than as a member of a union where one nation's interests, by nature of its size, are always likely to prevail. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I began tonight by referring back to the 1997 devolution campaign and I want to end there too. After the successful conclusion of that campaign and the passage of the bill setting up the Scottish Parliament, Tony Blair gave Donald Dewar a signed copy of the Scotland Act. Uh, that signed copy is now kept in the Parliament building at Holyrood. The Act was inscribed by Tony to Donald with these words. It was a struggle. It may always be hard, but it was worth it. Scotland and England together 
on equal terms. Now, the Scotland Act was most certainly a significant achievement that has rightly written the late Donald Dewar's name into the history books. And Tony Blair's sentiment in that inscription was undoubtedly a generous and sincere one, but it wasn't quite accurate. The last 14 years have shown the enormous value of devolution, but they have also shown the limitations of devolution. At Westminster, it is hard to be on equal terms when you contribute just 59 MPs in a parliament of 650. So Scotland, next year, on the 18th of September 2014, that date with destiny, uh, we face a choice of two futures. We can continue to make up a less than a tenth of the MPs in a parliament whose decisions on welfare, defence, the economy, routinely disregard our wishes, uh, not malevolently, but because of the nature of the balance of power in that institution, uh, disregard our wishes and yet affect key, often fundamental aspects of our lives. Or we can choose to become a truly equal partner through independence, addressing the union's democratic deficit, making sure that we always get the governments we vote for, we can take back the powers we need to meet our economic and social aspirations and play our full part together with our closest allies, neighbours and friends in a renewed, stronger, positive partnership of these isles. And ladies and gentlemen, that is what a yes vote next year is all about. Thank you very much.